The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 716 for Monday, July 2nd, 2018. Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, we mix it all together, and we create for you a potpourri of knowledge, information, and entertainment, with the goal being each and every one of us, that includes me, that includes John, that everybody, we all learn at least five new things every time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include Text Expander which now supports single sign-on. And we'll talk more about what exactly that means and how you can get a 20% discount off your first year subscription a little bit later. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. How are you doing today, Mr. John F. Braun? I'm oh, getting ready for the fireworks. We're doing our fireworks on the 2nd, I guess, because it's part of a long weekend, right? Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. whatever works. That's great. Is that so? Your town does its fireworks t- uh, tonight, tomorrow night. Well, tonight we're recording this on Sunday. The so uh, you do on the second. There you go. Thanks, John. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and cool. as you recall, when you lived in the area, it's cool because um, multiple towns typically do their fireworks. So if you're on the beach, which yeah. is where everybody goes, you not only see yours, but you see the fireworks of surrounding towns. Yeah, it's really quite a sight. We were up on the lake on Saturday. And uh, coming back, we just went for a day trip. So we, we came back across the lake uh, at about, I don't know, 9, 9.15. It had just gotten dark, you know. And and I don't think there were any town-sanctioned fireworks. But, of course, here in New Hampshire, you can you can do your own show if you like. And, um, and we probably, I think we saw four or five different pretty spectacular uh, fireworks displays as we came across the lake, which was really, really cool. So yeah. Lake Winnipesaukee for anyone that, uh, anyone that's interested in, in, uh, in which lake, but, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll put a link yeah. in the show notes. Cause that's what we do. Our, our, uh, state doesn't trust us to, right. well, well, they have displays that say fireworks, but they're really glorified sparklers. Right. We're not allowed to, we're not allowed to have anything beyond a sparkler. Yeah, we can have, so in New Hampshire, we can have anything, well, not anything we want. We cannot have firecrackers, right? So nothing with a bang, but we can have the, you know, rockets that shoot in the air and have the big, Mm. huge displays and all that stuff, but you can't buy anything that explodes uh, or it explodes with a bang. But, um, but in my town in Durham, everything is, is prohibited other, other than I think sparklers are okay, but, um, but but everything else in town, you need a permit from the, from the fire department. That is not true of most towns. It's just Durham. And probably because we have the university of New Hampshire here and by golly, if we didn't have some, uh, some law that said you can't shoot off fireworks all the time, it might be actually become a nuisance. So that's, that's my assumption as to where the, that particular law, it's sort of uh, the, the genesis of it. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We are here to talk about all kinds of things. And I did promise some cool stuff found as we started off here. So let's do it. Listener Chris sends in. He says, gentlemen, I always hear you speaking about keyboard maestro. I have been using Y key from plum amazing software previously. I key for almost 10 years now. And while my needs are simple, this tool has been extremely useful since purchase. Just throwing this application out there uh, to include it in the ring. It is being updated regularly and is, of course, compatible with Mac OS 10.13. So hi, Sierra. It works just fine with. So, yeah, it's 30 bucks and um, it is it looks to do some of this. It's kind of automation. Yeah, it, uh, it actually it is automation software. Um, and it, it actually links with KeyQ. So, yeah, it, very interesting. You can have launchers. You can have contexts that cause your shortcut to be activated. So this might be like a little bit of keyboard maestro, a little bit of control plane. Uh, and actually, we did get an email this week. Someone said that control plane 
even though it hasn't been updated in a long time, does still work with High Sierra, at least at least for them and, and for what they're doing. So I will throw that out there, too. I'll put that link in the show notes. So, yeah, fun. Right, John? More the merrier. The more the merrier. I, I don't disagree. All well, right. As far as automation solutions. As far, yeah, well, we need them uh, because th- those are the things that make our lives better. So I, I like any and all of, of this stuff that, that we come in. All right. Phil brings us to another cool stuff found. He says, uh, and this is a sweet one, I'll say. I'm not sure if you have used this on your show, but I found a Mac app called Tooth Fairy for $2.99 in the Mac App Store that makes it so much easier to switch your AirPods from your phone to your Mac. There's an icon that sits in your menu bar and one click uh, connects. But another option, which I use, is creating a keyboard shortcut, which even saves more time. I'm probably sure probably that there is a way uh, without using this app for a novice, uh, but for a novice, it provides a great and easy way to switch between the two. He says, and yes, uh, he says, I am running Mojave's beta. He says, I like the dark mode, except uh, in certain apps like iCal and or calendar and mail. So, uh, so obviously this tooth fairy works with, with everything up to and including whatever beta of Mojave he's running. So yeah, Brad, that that's cool. I have, I use, um, the the sound preference pane to do this um, because the sound preference pane allows you to put a little uh, icon in your menu bar that usually works to switch. But I have had times where it does not switch the AirPods right. So maybe Tooth Fairy does uh, does a little bit more. So thanks for that, Phil. Good stuff. Right. Good, John. Right. Cool. All right. And then. uh All right, let's go to Donna. We will keep on moving with our cool stuff found here. And Donna writes, she said, uh, Andy Anako recommended the, uh, on MacBreak Weekly, recommended the Anchor Soundcore Bluetooth travel speaker, which uh, she says she wears a women's size medium glove. And this thing fits easily in the palm of her hand with, with plenty of room to spare. It's, uh, it's fifteen ninety nine or sixteen ninety nine, depending on which color you get. And she said it doesn't have the strongest base, which I would expect out of something that small. But hey, for seventeen bucks, she says it's great to listen to podcasts and and things like that. So uh, we put a link to that in the show notes too. So thanks, thanks for that. If um, I it it is handy to have you know a small speaker that you can throw in your travel bag. I I. Uh, and and it, and what I'm going to recommend doesn't even com- come close to competing with this on price. But I I really like the the current version, which I believe is version four of the JBL Flip speaker. Um, it's it's bigger than this and costs more than this, but um, it actually has great sound for um, for for you know for what you need. Uh, you does know, it also for, have uh, pretty colors? The JBL nice Flip, show? no, the Flip does not. Um, but the uh, the JBL Pulse does, and the JBL because okay, I go ahead. No, I remember our playing with it in your your room one time when we were at a show, and it yeah, was, uh, it was neat to be able to select uh, all the patterns and they sync with the music, and uh, you know, you can have like a little uh, dance off or something. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Um, yeah, the JBL Flip is 80 bucks. I think the Pulse is, uh, you know what, I'll look it up while we're talking here. But um, the, yeah, the Pulse, okay, so the Pulse is, it's supposed to be 199 Amazon's got it for 166 so we'll put it in the in the thing. But the, the idea behind the Pulse, it's, it's quite a bit bigger than the Flip. The Flip and the Pulse are these sort of pill-shaped, you know, speakers, but large, larger than, than the palm of your hand. But still, I, I consider when I'm packing... And I want to bring a speaker with me. It's it's either the pulse or the flip and the pulse takes up the same amount of space in my luggage that a rolled pair of jeans would. And the flip takes up the same amount of space in my luggage that a rolled up T-shirt would. So I decide which can I go without. And and that's the speaker I bring because the pulse is cool. It really is nice to kind of have this, you know, electronic lava lamps sort of thing going on in your hotel room. Um, it adds some ambiance that otherwise is, you know, cold and sterile in, in a room like that. So 
Yeah, so there you go. Cool. Fun stuff. Generally, if I'm checking a bag, I'll throw the pulse in. And if I'm uh, doing a carry-on only, the flip is my friend. So there you go. Yeah? Good? Ready to move on, John? Moving right along. Moving right along to listener Matt, who has something for us. Matt says, uh, this is sort of a cool stuff found reprise. Guys, I was just listening to show 713 and you were talking about iCloud Drive and syncing files between Macs. I have had as many as four systems that I needed identical versions of client files on that, that totaled more than 35 gigs. I use Resilio Sync, formerly BitTorrent Sync, and have had, had almost no issues. The only problems come when you try to sync things like a MySQL uh, database file that can be rather large and changes constantly and often while you're working. Otherwise, Resilio Sync is fast and secure. And what's cool about it is it is peer to peer only. So if you have two Macs running Resilio Sync and you uh, want to sync, you know, data between them, that's the only place the data goes. You can run Resilio Sync on something like your Synology or, you know, on a on a server based type machine so that you also maintain a copy and, and sort of do that private cloud thing. But it is very much a peer to peer, not a client server syncing solution. So if you've got especially for for what Matt's talking about here, where you've got a lot of data that needs to you know, be in sync between two Macs. It's just syncing between those two Macs. You're not, you know, expending that, that, that transfer time twice or anything. So yeah. Yeah. Resilio sync's pretty cool. Okay. I guess the only concern that I would have is, well, I mean, so in the peer to peer mode, it's providing redundancy and that the file is stored on multiple clients. That's right. <clears throat> okay. So the bad news would be if all of a sudden all four got, clobbered or however many you have yeah it does stored on a server so no I'm, I'm just thinking through what the you know the the only downside would be you know if something terrible happened you did, wouldn't have it on the server to retrieve but, well uh, but that that could that same argument likely could be made for dropbox right if you this is the difference sure. between sync and backup right it doesn't really matter whether you have a server or, or just peer-to-peer -peer. if you blow away a file or change a file and in, in one place the idea is that it is synced everywhere. However, like Dropbox, Resilio Sync also does keep a versioning. So if something gets deleted or or you know changed, and you want to go back to a previous version, you can. And there there are some settings where you can choose how much uh, of a cache to keep of of old you know slash deleted items. So it tries to keep up with you, but but you're right. It's sync is not a replacement for backup. And speaking of backup, and I mentioned Synology in this bit too, we have uh, a, an episode coming up, Mac Geek Up 718. I'm doing a little bit of traveling, and so we're going to record uh, that earlier than we normally would. And so we will do a little deep dive into a couple of things. In fact, we've got a couple of deep dives coming up. We've got one on photos in that same episode. Um, one on, as I said, Synology, and I think we've got a Wi-Fi sort of networking revisit happening in, in 717. So you can look forward to all of that. And if you have stuff, of course, questions, tips, send it in to us. Feedback at MacGeekGab.com. That is what he said, folks. Feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Well, really what I said was feedback at MacGeekGab.com. So just oh, want to make sure sorry. I get that right. That's Okay. Hey, um, I, I mentioned in a previous episode when I was talking about how I had upgraded this machine here in the studio finally to High Sierra, and that's actually been going just fine, as you might have imagined. Uh, I mentioned that we were talking about screensavers and how on my iMac down in the office, I have the screensavers that we all get on our Apple TVs or our fourth gen Apple TVs and later where you see these beautiful overviews. I think they're either drone or hell. I think they're drone overviews of, of cities and co very cool things, high def stuff. It's amazing. And I have those running on my Mac uh, in the office and couldn't find them in the screensaver list here. I had taken for granted that they would be on every Mac. And of course, folks in the chat room pointed out, no, no, Dave, you installed those separately. And I did. So I have now put in the show notes, a link to the GitHub repo from John Coates for the Arial screensaver that does exactly this, and you can actually configure it. So when you when you go to GitHub, 
you see all like you can see all the source files and everything. But uh, he also has, if you scroll down the page, a download link for the latest build of it. And it works just great. I installed it up here and I actually now I need to update it downstairs. You can choose uh, one of the things that was different uh, for me is now you can choose where it stores all the video files that it downloads because they can be quite large. So I can choose to store it. I can and do choose to store them on an external drive so that it's not taking up my you know, my, my boot drive and things like that. So link to that. It's all for free. Um, very cool stuff. So there you go. Yeah. Right. Did you check those out yet, John? No, yeah. I've actually, I should, because I've actually been performing activities that we'll mention in the Synology episode that invoked my screensaver uh-huh. on this machine. Cool. Yeah. So it got me thinking. And I started looking at it. So yeah, maybe I'll uh, I'll explore. Uh, yeah. Explore you don't space. get these on your because you have an Apple TV Series Three, right? You don't get these screensavers on that. Okay, man, you're no. gonna be blown away. They're awesome. <laughs> we I sometimes mean, the... sit in the living room and watch just the screensavers. I mean, they're they're that good. So. I mean, I think I have mine set up so it displays pictures from. Either my Flickr, or I think my my uh no my photo library. So sure. yeah, it uses that as a screensaver. Sure, that's usually pretty good. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Um, one last cool stuff found a product from John Chafee, who used to uh has always made the calendar software that I like. He uh, he and Dave Riggle made a product years and years ago called Now Up to Date. Uh, and and now up to date in contact that was for pre Mac OS 10 max. And then, and then actually they sold it to somebody that sort of ruined it. And then they came back with something that they called busy Cal, which was very much uh, in the same vein. The busy, as I mentioned in a previous episode, busy Cal has now been taken over by uh, Fahad, the guy that does to do the number to do. And he's doing a great job with it. Actually it, that it's been like that for almost a year, at least six months. So like, Good news there. And that means that John Chafee is now working on something else and he's released it. It's called when.works and that's the URL when.works. It is an appointment booking engine. And what it does is it allows like I I've been using this for my Dave, the nerd business, right? I do some consulting. In fact, some of uh, you folks have have engaged me to do stuff that's, you know, sort of goes beyond the scope of what we do here uh, for you in the show. And I'm happy to do that for any of you. And now on my website, I've put a link to my calendars for when works. And the cool part is uh, I do two types of of meetings, right? I have on-site meetings for people that are local to me here in in Durham or wherever I happen to be. And then I also do, uh, you know, phone time or, you know, however we wind up doing it, FaceTime or whatever is that. And my, my procedures and, and the structure of things is different for on-site stuff. I have a one hour minimum for phone time. I don't need to do a one hour minimum because I'm not traveling anywhere. So there's no, you know, but like, my, t- my time invested in it starts when we start and that's fine. So I, I typically do a half hour minimum for phone stuff just because I don't want people stressing about trying to squeeze it all into the first 15 minutes we ever spend together. Um, and that's worked out really well. And so I've got on my website two different links and they both go to WenWorks. WenWorks pulls my availability from my calendar and then uses different parameters that I set for each appointment type to open or close different windows of opportunity. I can say, look, I need, you know, 15 minutes in between appointments. If they're, um, if it's, you know, uh, but phone time, but I want a half hour in between appointments. If it's, if it's, you know, on site where I'm driving around, I need a little extra time, a little buffer. I can set all that stuff and it's all very customizable per appointment type. And I don't have to expose all the links to you. Like I also have a lunch appointment thing that, you don't see when you visit my WenWorks calendar and that's okay. Right. But I can send the link to specific uh, folks. Very, very cool. And uh, he's kind of going with the freemium model here where you get, um, you get five appointments a month for free. And then, and then, um, uh, you know, you can pay five bucks a month and do unlimited appointments and things like that, but it syncs with your iCloud, Google, 
you know, Outlook, Office 365, all that stuff. So it's a cool thing, man. And I highly recommend checking it out. When dot works. So that's my, my contribution to cool stuff found for this week, John. There you go. Thoughts all on right. that? Yeah. Um, no thoughts on that, but let me ask you a question. I just noticed something on my, uh, on my Discord screen, mm-hmm. is the, uh, there's like a little meter and it says voice connected. Okay. It was red a few moments ago. So it's we like use showing one bar. So is that like packet loss? We use dis, we use Discord as our as the way that John and I talk with each other here. And yeah, if you're seeing so it, it's and and Discord is not peer to peer as we were talking about with like Resilio Sync. So John and I aren't connected directly to each other. We are connected to one of Discord's servers, and voice connected is the thing that uh, it is. So we get a, a meter, and it's either green yellow or red depending on how well your individual connection to discord server is mine is showing voice connected green yours is not is that right john or are you back to green it, i noticed I, I just noticed out of the corner of my eye that it was red mm-hmm. and then it turned green as i was glaring good. at it okay so, good uh, so, so okay. whatever issue there was it fixed it yeah 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 we mentioned that we moved to, from skype to discord for uh, a while back just be just based on sound quality and, and it's not perfect, but it's way better than Skype for sound quality. So um, I will, uh, I'll put a link to, to thing to what we did. So there you go. Put that in the show notes. Yeah. Keep an eye on that, John. And we can always ch- change servers uh, even midstream during the show while we have, while we, uh, if we have to. So I, in fact, I've done it while we've been recording without even pausing before it happens very, very quickly. I just have to make sure to do it when I'm talking, not while you're talking. So, cause, cause there is a brief interruption. So. Cool, man. Let me, uh, let me look at your packet loss here. Uh, no packet loss. Oh yeah. I think you disconnected and reconnected is what happened. That's interesting. You're still with me, right? Yep. Yep. All right, cool. I want to take a minute and thank all of our premium subscribers that, uh, that had contributions that come in, came in during the last week. Uh, as you know, if you are, if you have listened for a little while, we do offer a premium option here, which really is just to serve those of you that, uh, are interested, capable and willing, uh, to support us uh, directly here. And, uh, and obviously we very much appreciate that it's part of the whole way we can bring you this show every week. So thank you. Um, and premium listeners of course get, uh, in addition to the warm fuzzy feeling that you get from supporting your two favorite geeks doing something they love and hopefully you love, uh, you also get access to our premium at MacGeekab.com email address, which we, which is a box that we pay, uh, attention to first when we are doing these types of things. And it's just our way of saying thanks for helping us keep the lights on and all of that this week. Uh, those of you whose contributions came in include on the monthly $10 plan, John B, but I don't think that was you, John. In fact, I know it wasn't, it was a different John B, uh, Tony Z, Micah P, Nick S and Robert D. And on the every six month plan for 25, we have Brett H, Terrence N, Warren R, Robert P, Karen K, David P, David G, Jeffrey F, and Rick S. Thank you to all of you. You uh, you rock. And you know that, but I like to say it anyway, just to confirm it. So we it is confirmed. You rock. You all rock. I mean, you're all sending in questions. You're all we all participate in in the ways that we can, and that's what the Mac Geek Gab family is all about. Speaking of the Mac Geek Gab family, if you want to come to the Mac Geek Gab family room, per se, go to macgeekgab.com slash forums and visit and participate in our new Q&A discussion forums that we have there. It's working out really well. You can get questions answered. You can vote answers up or confirm that this is the answer to the question. So when somebody comes in six months from now with something similar, they can boom, see it right there. It's much better than what we had to sort of deal with, with the free for all that became uh, Facebook. It's fi- The group over there is actually fine. It's one of the best Facebook groups I've ever been a part of. And I'm very thankful that we have it. But in terms of questions, it's uh, it's it's difficult to see any history of it. So that's why we 
that's the big reason why we did this, this, uh, our own thing. So MacGeekGab.com slash forum. All right. A tip from Peter, John, Peter, uh, wants to remind us of something actually. And it, it really sort of, uh, came in a, I don't even have it. Oh, I do have it here. Yeah. Peter was, was doing some troubleshooting. He says after upgrading to 10.13.15, sorry, 10.13.5, I often receive the Mac death screen, now black, forcing a reboot. I was weighing various options. You know, it's interesting. I've been having that issue here in the the studio, so I might want to try the solution he proposes. He says, I was weighing various options, all of which were time-consuming, even with a bootable clone backup of 10.13.4. He said, before proceeding... I gave resetting the PRAM a try, which is just rebooting with command option PR. He says that solved it. And I just wanted to remind my fellow MGG listeners and hosts of this easy solution to fixing many woes. You know, it's not a bad idea. I always forget about that. Um, You know, it's easy to assume like, oh, no, this is, you know, a disaster that requires a time consuming fix before even trying the non time consuming stuff. And that includes a PRAM reset, which like I said, is reboot and hold down command option PR until you hear the startup chime again. And then you can let go. Um, it resets a bunch of the NVRAM parameters, but, and uh, also along with that is resetting the system uh, management console SMC, which is essentially the power manager of the Mac. And I think after doing a major operating system upgrade, it's probably not a bad idea to do a PRAM and SMC reset. And I probably should do that here in the, uh, in the studio. So I, I'm not going to do it right now, obviously, but, but uh, I'm putting it on the list. So thank you, Peter, for the tip and the reminder that rocks. So there you go. Yeah. Brian Monroe in the chat room at MacGeekup.com slash stream. Hello. Uh, reminds us, he says, there's no startup chimes on the new MacBook pros. So while you can still reset the PRAM, you kind of have to go, I guess you go by, uh, by Spidey sense as to when you should release it. I mean, you'll see the Apple icon come up and then it goes away and sort of starts over again. So there is visual indication that, that it, it has restarted. So that's, that's how you do it. And Brian confirms that. So thanks, man. That's actually really good advice. <laughs> Easy to forget. Thoughts on this, John? Hmm makes me sad that they got rid of the it's a useful diagnostic tool Mm -hmm. i don't disagree with that and actually a lot of the you know a lot of the startup uh key sequences uh some are very persnickety as far as when they should happen to make certain other things happen and having that chime there what i'm saying is that a lot of them you should really you know hit them most of them you you should hit before the chime if you hit it after the chime it's probably not going to work yeah, right. Well, it depends, right? Because doing safe mode, right, you actually want to hit the shift key right after the chime. At least that's always been my MO. But but the chime is my is my sign. It's like, okay, here's the, the chime. Okay, go. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brian Brian says he shakes his angry fist at getting rid of both the, both the light up Apple logo on the back and the reboot chime on the new MacBook Pros. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll say the logo that was cosmetic but the chime is not really cosmetic right 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 yeah i agree Mm -hmm. i agree hey you want to take us to a tip from phil john phil's got a great one here so phil says my mom is not the most tech savvy person sorry mom um and she got this email and forwarded it to me and i think i'm gonna describe the email to you before continuing and the email uh the the it said summary report your Apple ID was logged in iCloud via a web browser. It's like oh that that that's kind of an Apple like message. Maybe there's an Apple logo at the top. So yep, and it says dear uh, Apple the, the Apple ID email address. Your Apple ID was used to sign into iCloud via a web browser, and it gives the date and time and the browser. It says Opera, and it says the info is familiar. Blah blah blah. Um, but if you want to confirm your data, and it has a little little button in it saying confirm uh, copyright. 2018 Apple Inc. Wow, that, that looks pretty uh, looks pretty authentic to me there, Dave. Um, but to continue with the email, mom is 
sharp as a tack when it comes to language and notice right away that the alleged sign-in happened today at 11.25 p.m., which unless someone has created a time machine, not the backup, there's no way that could happen. <laughs> so in this case, just reading it carefully and not freaking out helped her realize that it was a fake and she didn't click yeah. on anything. Go mom. Yeah. Um, I mean, looking at this, I mean, you saw it too. I mean, uh, I'll add something to this though. Um, so it did look real, including, well, but, but some, so some notes here when you're getting, when you get emails. So the one thing that would probably lead one to believe it's legitimate is that it's from manage.apple.com. The thing is, you should know that forging a email address, a, a from address is trivial. So don't use that to verify that something is uh, legitimate. Um, but what you can do, so it had a little confirm button in here. And what you can do is if there's HTML like that in the email, if you hover over the button, after a moment, it will show you the URL that it brings it to. And in this case, this would be another way to verify that this is bogus, is that it goes to HTTPS colon slash slash C0 N-F-I-R-M dot email. Mm. Uh, and then there's some more more stuff there. Um, last I checked, uh, C0 uh, confirmed email is not an Apple domain. <laughs> and I actually went to the, uh, I actually went to the site and it looks pretty real. And I think somebody's reported them because now you get warnings from Google. So I think somebody's flagged it as a, as a, a phishing site. That it didn't yeah, the first time I tried it. Yeah. And I think what else did I have in my head here? Okay. A lot of times, if you see, what looks like a website that's been compromised and that somebody's figured how to put phishing software on it, which I think is what happened in this case. Um, I still think uh, as a general rule, writing to abuse at and the name of the domain may get to the administrator so that they know their system has been compromised. I, ha I haven't done that in a while. It's technically supposed abuse at and postmaster at are addresses that every domain that accepts email is supposed to have now, you know, it, there's no one forcing you to do this uh, unless there is like, I mean, if you run your own mail server, no one's forcing you, but if you host your mail with, you know, any major uh, domain provider or anything like that, they will not let you delete the abuse at and post postmaster at addresses like those have to go somewhere or they make it very difficult they tell you don't do this have them so yeah in theory abuse at should be there but again you know like you said this isn't abuse um i mean it's, sending it to abuse at apple.com i mean I, it might be helpful in that someone at apple will take this and and investigate it but no one has breached Apple's mail servers to do this. Like you said, you're, they're just spoofing the return address. So it's not, you know, there may be no place to, to, to report mail abuse to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. mm. I don't know. It's yeah. Awesome. But, yeah. um, now where would you, if you would, cause I mean, it, it, I mean, it's somebody spoofing, you know, Apple, you know, they're trying to harvest uh, Apple IDs, and, uh, and that's not good. Right. I'm wondering the best address to write at Apple to resolve that. Oh, I mean, you could write abuse at Apple.com, but I, I guess what oh. I'm saying is, like, no aspect of this email came from Apple, right? It's not like no, somebody somebody breached Apple's database. They're just, they're just sending out these emails trying to look like they're from Apple. But... It, it maybe, and I think at, I think at some level this is this is true that there is a department at Apple that does chase down some of the more egregious phishing attempts like this. But but it, but it's not they're not patching breaches. It's just like you could do this on your home computer if you wanted and create fake emails and send them to addresses. You could buy a list of addresses. And send them in the hope that you get some small percentage of people that put in enough of their information that you can compromise their Apple ID. And I'm obviously not recommending that any of you do this, but it is totally possible and probably wouldn't take you a whole lot longer to do than it did for me to describe. It's it's a fairly trivial thing to to do, which is unfortunate, but it's just it's how the how the system currently works. So, yeah, there you go. 
Any more on that one, my friend? No, I think we're uh, no, we're good. Coolio. All right, I want to take a minute and talk about uh, our first sponsor, which is Text Expander. As I mentioned in the intro, Text Expander now supports single sign-on, which makes things really handy if you're using Text Expander at your business because they support G Suite, One Login, Okta, right? And and that way you don't have to create new accounts for your whole team. And the question then comes up, Dave, why would I want all of everybody in my company to log into Text Expander? Well, Text Expander is awesome for creating little snippets of text uh, that you send out repeatedly. I have them for my email addresses, for my phone numbers. I have them for my snail mail address, my uh, John's snail mail address, right? So I don't have to think about these things when somebody says, what's your phone number? I'm filling out a web form. Uh, you know, I can just type in the little, you know, shortcut, which for my cell number, because we're in the 603 area code is just C603 and boom, it expands it for John's address. I do comma JBADD and it just barfs out John's address. So if somebody needs to send something to us, I can just put these things there. It's very quick. I'm assured of not fat fingering anything, but you can also use these for things like your customer service emails where you, you know, you, you send something out and you're like, Oh, that's perfect. Great. I want to save that and use it again. Well, instead of copying and pasting it to some document that you paste it out of every time you want to use it, you assign it to a snippet and you type, you know, comma CS and you can, I, I use comma to start all of my snippets, but you don't have to, you can, you know, you can have them be anything you want, but you know, it could be comma CS response one or be, whatever, you know, some, something that you name it and then boom, it barfs out this request. And when you sync with everybody on your team, everybody's using this same perfectly crafted customer service response. Text expander even lets you have data entry points in it. So you can put in, it will ask you, you can have it prompt you, you know, what's the person's name or pull the name from the email. If you want, it can do some automated things. What was the date of the thing they purchased from you? What was the name of the item or product or service they purchased? And boom, it all puts it together. Really great stuff. So check it out. Go to textexpander.com slash podcast. That's where you can get 20% off of your first year subscription of this on check. I know it sounds generic. It is textexpander.com slash podcast is where you go. And then on checkout, it'll ask you which podcast you heard about it from. And obviously, you know the answer there. So our sincere thanks to Text Expander for sponsoring this episode. All right, man. You had a question in the pre-show, which I thought was a great question to ask. And your question was how to position the doc, uh, how to choose which screen the doc appears on with multiple monitors. And it's a great question. So the, the first thing to talk about is that this doesn't really happen in the uh, doc system preference pane. It happens in the display system preference pane. Uh, but... Before that, even, you have to decide how you're configuring your multiple displays, and that's in mission control. You have mission control on, right, John? Uh, I see it here. Yes. Do you have the box check that says displays have separate spaces? Yes. Okay. So that is the, um, that is the thing that chooses whether you have a menu bar on both displays or not right so you have a menu bar on both displays right um yes okay so that's the that's the default way of doing it but i also call it for us long old timers the new way of doing it which i think was introduced in oh mac os 10.11 or something like that where uh it used to be that you only had a menu bar on one display. Now you can have it on all displays. And and it also comes with some other user interface differences. I don't want to call them quirks. But uh, if you don't have that checked, then what, what? So I'm curious now, actually, because I haven't done this in a while. If you go into displays, John, and go to arrangement. You. Yeah. This is where if you don't have multiple displays, you won't have this tab. But if you do, this is where you can tell your Mac 
how your displays relate to each other in physical space so that when you drag a window from one to the other, it appears to happen seamlessly, right? You, you have to give it some, some hints and this is where you just yeah. draw it. Yeah. Do you have a top one of those screens? Do you have a white bar that goes across or is it across both of them? Uh, is across it the rightmost screen. Okay. So, and if you choose to put your dock at the bottom of the screen, does that appear on the rightmost screen? Usually, but not always. Which really? Is original. Really? Yeah. Some, sometimes it gets stuck on the... My expectation is that it would be on the screen that, or with the window that's frontmost, or the app that's frontmost is where my dock would be, and that's not always the case. There's huh. something weird going on. Huh. That's interesting. Huh. Yeah. Let me get rid of this. Oh, yeah, I'm going to the leftmost screen, and now the dock's not following. Hmm. So the dock follows from screen to screen when you're in this. Well, that's mode. my expectation. It doesn't always do that, though. And I'm wondering if it's one of the apps that. So what I have on my left screen is I have Discord and I have the uh, our, yeah. our chat app, and then on my rightmost screen I have everything else. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 And and it it might make things a little janky but grab in in system preferences displays grab that white bar which you should just be able to grab just the white bar and drag it from whatever display it's on to the other one yeah it lets me do that okay and things will probably uh -oh. flicker and, and oh, redraw a little yeah. bit yep and now the dock is on that screen okay so that's how you get the dock to follow I, th oh, what a pain I, in the neck. Yeah. I didn't think the doc and I, again, you do this more than me. So maybe the doc does follow, but I didn't think the doc followed. If you put it on the left or the right, it will be on the very left screen, the left of the very left screen or the right of the very right screen. Right. But if you put it at the bottom, it will be on whatever screen that menu bar is on. That's what I thought. And it sounds yeah. like that's what's well, happening for you. Most yeah. of the time. Huh? Yeah, whatever. Now, the I, the world. I, I, and this is just a personal preference thing, but I, you know, it's always good to try different stuff. I always recommend to people try putting the dock on the side of the screen. Uh, I like it on the left, but I know people who, who like it just as much on the right. And the reason I recommend that is because for most of us, our screens are much wider than they are tall. And so, by having the dock on the bottom of the screen, you're chewing into the uh, space that you get on the shortest axis. And so I, I and I don't like to have my dock hide and appear, but I, some people do. And that's total, obviously totally fine. But uh, I like to have mine up all the time. So by putting it on the side of the screen, I'm having my dock encroach upon the uh, axis of my screen that has the most width to spare and therefore now i can get you know almost full top to bottom uh windows in a normal configuration which i really really like so i i just recommend it, especially on laptops that you know having the dock on the bottom can make things feel really cramped whereas putting it on the side it's like oh yeah it's it's there and everything's copacetic so that's my that's my advice to try it see how you like it that's what i like yeah I just got a boat. I mean, I must have like 30 icons in here. Maybe I should clean that up. It'd well, just get kind of cramped if I did it on the, uh, no, no. Yeah. I'll play around with it. Cool. Coolio. Uh, we had a question come in from listener, David. Let me, uh, let me find that question so that I can get it right. Well, oh no, that's no good. Oh, they're way too tiny. <laughs> no, things aren't good. For we'll you. stay. We'll, we'll stay on the bottom. Okay. <laughs> oh, when you moved it from the bottom to the left, things got got too tiny. Is that right? Well, yeah, I got a sixteen by nine aspect ratio yeah. on this thing. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it's just it's just that the it's too small mm. for me to. Uh, I hadn't thought about that. That smaller uh, than side I would liked. Yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, I could change. No, I guess. You can change the size to yeah. a limited extent. Hmm. Yeah. Anyways. All right. Uh, listener David sent in a request and he said, which password manager do you recommend or use? He, he says, I was thinking one password or last pass, 
but I'm seeing a lot of love for Dashlane. He says, rather than trust CNET or PC Magazine, I trust you. Also, uh, oh, and then, yeah, then he asked how he could increase his Mac Geek Gab contribution. So I explained that to him, too. Uh, in terms of password managers, and, uh, and I'll start right out of the gate, uh, as anybody that listens to the last episode knows, 1Password just came out as a sponsor um, uh, of the show. <clears throat> but that doesn't really impact our advice here. In fact, I, I think it's, with, with them specifically, as it is with many companies, it, it's sort of the reverse. Um, you know, we we talk enough about a product and they say, well, we want to, you know, this is an audience we want to get in front of and, and support. And so, the, you know, they came on board. Uh, one password is the one that I've used for a very long time. And I, I've i tried, I, I have not tried Dashlane. I've tried many others and really keep coming back to one password for the user interface. John uses LastPass. I've tried LastPass. Um, the the functionality of it is is actually great. Uh, it's cross platform functionality. At least when I tried it, it, was better than than most others. Although Dashlane probably now competes very equally there, or or perhaps even better. Uh, but its user interface was something I could just. It always felt foreign to me and felt very wonky. And then of course there's the one that we haven't mentioned that we all have, which is Safari's or iCloud Keychain but Safari's password manager. Safari's password manager is actually great. It syncs natively inside Safari for all of your devices, which we will sort of get with iOS 12 with third-party password managers, finally, which is great. Um, but I really like using uh, iCloud Keychain alongside 1Password for that reason. But what iCloud Keychain, it, 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 ba it does password generation, password syncing, and that's it. And it does those things very well, but that's it. It doesn't do two-factor authentication. It doesn't, which would also be called one-time passwords because sometimes it's two-step, sometimes it's two-factor, and uh, it's better to just call them one-time passwords, um, like the Google Authenticator app will do. But uh, it doesn't do those, and it doesn't do any sort of threat assessments which a lot of the other ones do, right? Where like one password, and I think LastPass does this too. You can chime in on this, John, but um, it will look at the passwords that you're using and do some sort of threat assessment. We talked in the sponsor block in the last episode about how one password is now actually comparing your passwords locally. It's not sharing them. It downloads a database of known compromised passwords and compares your password to it. And, and it can say definitively, I know you think that this is a unique password, but I have it in a database and it is not unique and you should change it. And um, and and then it will facilitate some of that. It'll, it'll like one password warns me when I have um, uh, when I have an account on a site that supports two factor auth, but I don't have that enabled. It will tell me that Dashlane, I think, um, will automatically change your passwords on some websites. I mean, I, I say automatically you tell it to do it, but you don't have to actually log in and do it. They, they sort of have the script built in. And so you, if it's oh, yeah. like, right, you know, Hey, you've got LastPass a bad password. Does that for, okay. Yeah. They do that for sites that, you know, don't keep monkeying with that part of the site. So mm. yeah, I guess it simulates you using a browser to update your password. Exactly. Right? Yep. Yep. It's pretty, uh, pretty handy. But yeah, da so Dashlane is the one that keeps coming up that um, that I have not tried, um, but but probably should. Uh, you know, yeah, there you go. The, um, the only hiccup uh, we had a question a while ago. Um, the only thing with uh, with iCloud Keychain is that sometimes if you update the OS, or at least we found that at least got one report, uh, it was turned off. Because all of a sudden the person was like, ah, what the hell? What happened to all my passwords? Yeah, it's yeah. Like, oh, um, yeah, yeah it's true. turn it back on. They were in the cloud. The problem was because the feature was disabled, it wasn't populating. It wasn't so, updating. Uh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then as for LastPass, I'm looking right now. So I'm running the uh, LastPass app on my Mac here, and they have a security challenge section. And it basically lists, oh, gosh, I got to, uh, uh, my score is not that great. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, so it'll show the number of accounts, um, duplicates, 
compromised, which I guess is the thing you were talking about. So, so I have none compromised. I have duplicates, which I still have to fix. Weak passwords, old passwords, and blank passwords. And it comes up with a score and then uh, lists them all. And, and you can uh, f- fix the problems there. So, sure. um, so similar to one password, it um, makes sure you uh, get all your ducks in a row there. Or yeah. Good passwords. Yeah, which is good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it, it, I, interestingly, I was kind of looking through news feeds and, and that sort of thing this morning, right before we recorded the show. And I saw that, oh, I forget who wrote it. Bradley Chambers over at nine to five Mac wrote an article or published an article that says, what's the best password manager for Mac OS and iOS. And, uh, I'll, I'll, I mean, he's got a, it's a great little, little dive into it there. The, the net is he, he felt exactly the same way I did. Like there's some great options out there. However, the one that feels most like home is one password. And, and, uh, sounds like that's the one that, that, you know, that he uses, but it, it's worth reading through this to, to, you know, just get some of those, um, some of those ideas out there. So I will, I'll put a link to that in the show notes for sure. For all of you, it was a good, a good read for certain. So yeah, there you go. There you go. And you like, you like one, uh, sorry, you like LastPass's interface, right, John? You're used to oh, it. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. Um, it, um, I mean, it doesn't always come up. The iOS version doesn't always uh, integrate as well as the Mac version. Sure. But you find, like, and I, I'm sp- uh, speaking specifically for the Mac, you find that pretty usable. Oh yeah. They, yeah, they have an extension, Safari yeah. extension, or actually an extension for any major browser. Sure, and um, yeah, yeah. you log in, and then uh, when you get to a site that it knows about it, you know, just figures out the fields to populate and populates them. So, uh, cool. And like cool. I said, you can you know do uh, update you know or change your password or make it stronger. Things yeah, like yeah, that. right. No, right. I'm very. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm very happy with it. I mean, cool. th- they've. I mean, both them and one password have had issues over the years, but they've been pretty good about fixing them. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I just couldn't. I, the, the, the way that UI was was just a little herky jerky for me. Yeah. Check it. Check it again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I guess I my only know. concern with, you know, one that isn't the one that you and I use is that it's kind of the new kid on the block and. uh you know, it's easy to make mistakes. Uh, What's that? Dashlane? Or has it been around a while? We just has it? Paying attention. I, yeah, I think I Dashlane's know. been around a while. I, I, I think. I think. Uh, yeah, it came out in 2012. So they got, you know, almost six years. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Dashlane's been around a while. Yeah, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't worry right. about them just, in that regard at all. Yeah. Okay. Just hasn't hit our radar. All right. Yeah. I mean, it's come up occasionally, but, but yeah, neither one of us has really dug into it. So. Yeah, it's it, and it's probably worth digging into as well. So, Coolio, yeah, yeah. All right, uh, where are we here? I know we've got other stuff to go through. Let's do it. Tom, you want to take us to Tom, John? I'll take us to Tom. Sweet. Hey guys, I've got an issue with an external four gigabyte Lacy hard drive that keeps ejecting when the iMac is sleeping. My client says she wakes the iMac. She intermittently. And she intermittently gets the improperly ejected error message. Sometimes the drive will mount properly after she clicks OK on the error message. And sometimes she has to turn off the drive and turn it back on for it to mount. The drive is connected directly to one of the USB ports on the iMac. I've had her switch USB ports to help narrow down if the issue is the drive or the iMac. The intermittent ejecting is still happening after switching ports. I've read about waking issues with Lacy drives from Lacy's website. And they say that the error message was an issue with Mac OS reporting the issue before the drive was actually mounted, but I think it could be a problem with the drive. Hopefully it's not a problem with the USB ports on the iMac. I tried looking at the system log file to see if they could see any errors around the time the error was reported by the user, but I don't see anything unusual. I've included a couple of the system log files, uh, which I don't think I've looked at. Sorry. Um, (laughs) We can still answer this. Um, It's a 2012, 27 inch iMac, 32 gigs of RAM, three terabyte fusion drive. Maybe you guys have seen this kind of behavior. I just want to make sure if it's a hard drive issue or an issue with the iMac. One is much easier to replace. By the way, I don't like the changes in the console app. 
Yeah. In the, in the later versions of Mac OS. Yeah, I'm with you there. Um, it's harder to find errors, if I'm not mistaken. Errors only since about 1.30 a.m. are recorded in system log on a daily basis. Yeah. All right. Yeah, the, con- the console app has been engineered now for the last two op- you know, updates to major updates, rather, to Mac OS. It's been engineered to be a developer tool, not a troubleshooter's tool. Uh, I, I, that's how it feels to me. So anyway, but, but go on, please, my friend. All right. Well, we have heard of drives from various manufacturers exhibiting this whole improperly ejected symptom. Uh, one thing you may want to do, um, one suggestion is you may want to go to system preferences, energy saver. And if there's a thing that says put hard drive to sleep when possible, I not do that. Um, otherwise, I've seen the issue being related to quirky firmware. Now, in this case, though, he says that Lacy pointed the finger at Apple being the cause of the problem here, but maybe it's Lacy. So, some drives allow you to update the firmware. So, you may want to give that a whirl as well. Uh, as far as a different USB port, that that's a good suggestion. Um, and that I actually recently, and we'll go into detail in a future episode, but I actually had an issue where I think it was because there's uh, something wonky with the USB ports on my MacBook Pro. But um, a port not providing enough or intermittent power could be the cause of this as well. And from what I see, on th- that particular machine has four USB ports. Um, while I'm guessing that they're all on the same internal USB hub, they may not be. Uh, you can see this in um, uh, system info. If you look at, uh, I think, the USB category, you can see the uh, the cascade. So they may be on one USB hub. They may not be. Um, but you may want to try all the ports. I know that's a pain in the neck, but try all four of the ports here. Maybe maybe you'll find a good one. It could also, and I've had this happen, Dave, it could also be a flaky cable. I had one external enclosure that had a tendency to give the improper eject message if I moved it around while it was running, which... You should be able to move it around, at least in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. So it was a bad connection or bad bad cable. Never rule out the cable. And huh. finally, as a suggestion here, if you don't like the new console, there is a dandy app called Consolation 2. And I think they're working on Consolation 3, but Consolation 2 is the latest release version. And one thing that it has, Dave, is an option to output results in what I believe was what we were familiar with, which is the syslog format. Um, so if we go to ec- eclecticlight.co slash downloads, you can get consolation as well as a boatload of uh, other cool utilities. So that's what I got. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It The... Um the the sleep drive thing can uh, that's that's a great one to remember to try because like you said some third party drives just don't play nicely with that um there used to be a utility like, and now i'm dating myself you know pre mac os 10 from actually from john gotow uh, at st clairsoft who makes now you know we talk a lot about default folder and app tamer and uh and jettison we mentioned recently he made a utility called sleeper he doesn't make it anymore it doesn't exist I, but i will um I'll, I'll put a link to a screenshot of it in the show notes where where you could really manage this on a on a well it was on a drive by drive basis but you were doing it by scuzzy ids if that means anything kids ask your parents right um but uh that allowed some granular uh, configuration, if you will, of the um, of the of which drives got to sleep and which drives didn't, and all that stuff. But anyway, it doesn't exist anymore. I don't know of any utility that does that for Mac OS. If there is one, I feel like there should be one. I feel like maybe there is actually one, but I I don't know. I can't remember it. So. <sighs> I mean, in the grand scheme of things, I mean, if you look at, I mean, most drives from what I've seen, even rotational drives, I mean, they consume what, on the order of tens of watts, maybe? Yeah. You know, like yeah. a light bulb. Yeah. So um, is it really worth saving those pennies when it's consuming 
tens of watts versus uh, and most drives when you sleep them i think they go down to like you know really low like maybe a single watt single digit watts so so it it depends on how many drives you're running right but at scale i think yes but for most of us in our homes probably not however a spinning drive is more is about more than just consuming power right so you've got um heat that's generated by the drive and also wear and tear on the on the internal mechanisms in a spinning drive mm. right so mm, it, 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 right you know um i mean it's very interesting whenever in in like one of my synology units or a drobo unit or whatever if i buy two three four drives all at the same time and put them all in one of those units they all die within you know a month to three months of each other Right. I mean, it, this is just like they start exhibiting errors and it's like, all right, immediately start replacing them, because if you don't, they're all going to be dead soon. And, and whatever you think you have for fault tolerance doesn't actually exist. So I, I think there is something to be said about, you know, the number of rotations a drive makes and the number of hours it's running being very much related to its longevity. You can't really predict for any specific drive, what that's, what that number is going to be. But I, I really think it is related to that. So, you know, there you go. I don't know. That's, that's the way I look at it. You want to take us to Phil or should we jump to our, uh, some of our tips and stuff, John? Um, Phil's kind of, yeah. Okay. But this is going to be kind of a, maybe a community challenge. I think, sure. cause I don't know if we quite figured it out, but it's a, it's a weird symptom. Okay. And Phil says, I'm trying to use my Mac to create a spoken track of a PDF for someone who has limited vision. I tried selecting the text, then go to the services menu, and then say add to iTunes as a spoken track. And it isn't working. Here's the PDF of the book. I would appreciate it if you or anyone could create this as an MP3 file. Thanks. So you That's actually, in, in, in solving this, you actually found where for with most things, you can actually do this. Right. He, his, he had a very sort of unique scenario that that prevented him from creating a PDF or an audio file from a, a, a book. Right. But but you were able to do it with sort of generic PDFs. Isn't that right? And that's the thing. So so I went. So I haven't even really realized that there is this feature, but uh, but it's pretty cool. And yeah, it does as expected um, in some cases. But I went through the same motions he did. And while it claimed to be writing the speech to a file. Which once you're done, it'll appear in iTunes as a as a track. But um, I never so saw you, it appear. See, I or no, I'm sorry, I did not see it appear. So it claimed to be generating the file, but when I went into iTunes after I, you know, did, did this operation on the text from the PDF that he sent me, there was nothing there. So wait, how do you do this? You, so you open the PDF in Preview. Yes. Okay. And then you can do that. Yeah. Well, okay. hi highlight some text and then right click and you should have a. In the services menu, I don't have any add to iTunes thing. Maybe I should. Uh, I think you should. <laughs> I'm not sure why you don't. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely do not. Um. But is it possible that I have turned that service off? Yeah, well, let me look on my mini. Okay. Yep, I see it right here. So so on my mini, I opened up a, a, a PDF, just a regular PDF. It opens it in preview. And if I highlight some text in the PDF, the first choice is add to iTunes as a spoken track. So All I right. see it on both my machines. I'm not sure why you're not yeah. seeing it. So well, I do. I know why I'm not seeing it. Mm -hmm. So if I go into system preferences, keyboard and go to shortcuts, uh, there's all kinds of shortcuts. But there is uh, about halfway down the list, an option for services with a little gear next to it. And this is where you get to decide which services show up in that right click menu. And you can it's probably worth, in fact, going through this and. And choosing the ones you want and removing the ones you don't want just to clean things up. And I guess at some point in my life, uh, in the text section, there is an option here, which on mine, no great surprise, is turned off, which now I've turned on. And it is add, add to iTunes as a spoken track. So there you go. 
I don't know why I turned that off years ago or how it got turned off, but that's where you can control this stuff. So yeah, very cool. Yeah. And I guess he had created his with something that, that maybe doesn't expose well, here, this as text. And so well, here's, here's what I did. So I tried. So as you mentioned, yeah. So, so I tried highlighting text in one of my PDFs and it works and it was fine. Um, so I'm like, what's the difference between my PDF and the PDF that he sent me? And I think I know the reason why this did not work. Okay. It gets even stranger. So I did a get info on the file and uh, a PDF will show you, uh, there's a, there's a more info section in that window. It'll show you some, uh, some details about sure the PDF. And here's the thing that's, that, that um, jumped out at me is that the content creator for it is Calibre. 3.24.0. What is Calibre? Calibre looks to be a ebook platform. Yeah, so they may have set some permissions on this PDF that keep you from doing exactly this. Maybe. What because happens if tried, you go to the encryption tab in previews, get info window for the PDF? Oh, okay. Right? There's, there's a, a there's security the, flag and more info, and it says none, but let me uh, let me double click on this. All right. So wh where are you saying? Where should I go? So uh, do a get, you know, open the PDF in so preview. Yep. Yep. Do your get info, which I think I, I just did command I. I'm not sure. Oh, it's in the tools menu. So do, ins yeah, it turns on the inspector is what it is. And then the, at least in High Show Sierra. Inspector. Yep. The third tab over is the encryption inspector. And if you click no. that, what do you say? What does it say for permissions? Uh, it says you have full permissions. You, it, does it say, because what I have is you have full permissions for this PDF. You can copy text, <clears throat> print, or make changes to this PDF and save. Is that what yours says? Yeah, that's what it claims, but that's not what I see. Because so I what happens to... if you copy that text? Like highlight the text in the PDF and then just copy it, paste it into a text edit document and try to create your iTunes from there. When I tried that on one machine, yeah, it would look like it was pasting the text. Then I could see like a highlighted area, but the yeah. text itself did not appear. Okay. So they're so doing know something to some... obscure the text. Yeah, for sure. They shouldn't because they claim to be a, a DRM free uh, ebook solution. But um, huh. so their generator may just be generating... Yeah, that's true. Yep. There's something unusual in the in the, the PDF that interesting doesn't make it across to this uh iTunes. Yeah, right. Right. All right. Transcription. But then the final thing is that so um so not to be discouraged, but Phil put in the extra effort here. And that this is the thing that totally baffled me. So uh he thought he'd put a little uh, automated workflow together to accomplish this and that worked here's the bizarre thing is that the workflow has exactly two lines in it dave the first line is get ton contents of clipboard aka copy like yeah. we just tried and the second step is text to audio file <laughs> and that worked for him so so it yeah so it's something about the way this pdf is interacting with preview and how it presents itself to the user interface, not the contents of the PDF itself. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, cool. Hey, he figured it out. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. We have a bunch of follow-ups from previous episodes, and I think I'm going to get through them. Let's see what happens here. So for uh, back, we'll, we'll go in order, uh, I think. Right. Maybe. Was I not smart enough to do sure. this in order? Okay, cool. Uh, going back to Mac Geek Gab 708, uh, David pointed out that uh, he was subscribed to both iTunes Match and iCloud Music Library, a.k.a. Apple Music. And or or as part of not not a.k.a. but iCloud Music Library as part of Apple Music and you get iTunes match functionality as part of your Apple music subscription and you don't need both. He contacted Apple support and uh, said, Hey, you know, I've been paying for this for a while. Uh, I don't need it. What's the, what's the deal. And he said, 
if I had known that I didn't need iTunes Match with my Apple Music subscription, I would have canceled iTunes Match two years ago. And uh, and he he actually sent us a screenshot of the chat trail. And sure enough, uh, Apple said he asked, he said, I'd like a refund for the past two years of iTunes Match that I've been paying for that I don't need. And they came back and said, yeah, OK, here you go. We'll credit you. So a heads up to anybody that's paying for iTunes Match. Stop. But also ask Apple for uh, for a credit if you've been paying for it and um, and have had also had that Apple Music subscription, because chances are you might get one. So there you go. So thank you for that, David. Thanks for the the heads up on that. Uh, all right. Moving on to man, I didn't move any of these into our our thing. So I've just got to be really smart about this. Uh, listener John, I think. Yeah, in 709, tipped us, or listening to 709, we were talking about Apple Pay uh, addresses on your Mac. He says, and you were wondering how to set up addresses for Apple Pay credit cards on your Mac. He says, I suspect the reason it's not easy for you to find out how to change the addresses for Apple Pay for a card on your Mac is because your Mac does not directly use Apple Pay for web transactions, but rather uses another device to do Apple Pay for it instead. The only Macs, he says, that I know of that can actually do Apple Pay on their own by themselves are the Touch Bar MacBook Pros because they can authenticate with Touch ID on the machine itself. On my Touch Bar MacBook Pro, there is a control panel item for wallet and Apple Pay, just like there is on the iPhone and Apple Watch. You simply click on that, select your card, and then select the appropriate address, and you're finished. Macs without Touch ID do not have this control panel. Thanks, man. That is That answers the mystery right there. So very, very cool. Uh, I'm very appreciative of that. I, I always... That makes perfect sense that they need those uh, those kinds of things. So very cool. Uh, all right. And then Paul from 714 writes, he says uh, he sent us this cool thing. This I mean, this is as much of a cool stuff found as it is anything else. Somebody took a UPS uh, and changed from having a battery in it, which can die, as we mentioned, uh, to having a super capacitor bank in there, which just holds power long enough to, you know, to overcome any, you know, short term outages or brownouts or whatever. And uh, and you can build a super capacitor bank fairly inexpensively. So we'll we'll put a link to this YouTube video that he found. Uh, we'll put that in the show notes because by golly, it's pretty cool, man. Um, did you check out this video, John? No. Okay. It's, no. it's worth it. I'll put it in. I'll put it out there. It's, it's, you know, do you, you know about super capacitors? I really, I, this is my first um, time learning of them. I know about capacitors and I know about their ability to store. Yeah. Uh, as well as release. Yes. Power. And, uh, you may want to be, uh, careful because <laughs> you're dealing with a lot of power there. Absolutely. Yep. 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 <laughs> you can be dealing with a lot of power. So just. Uh... Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. So I found another article about it. And then I found one UPS vendor, Marathon Power at marathon-power.com uh, that actually makes uh, a, a commercially available supercapacitor uh, UPS, which is pretty cool. So. Uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes too, because you know, this is, this is fun stuff. So there you go. Cool. Uh, and while we're on the subject of UPSs, you know, I, uh, as we all know, I had those two brownouts during the, uh, the, I, I guess it was seven fourteen. Uh, it was with, when pilot Pete was here and it caused, because my UPS battery had, uh, sort of reached the end of its life cycle, in my it's my uh, br 1300 g is the unit that i have so i replaced that battery it cost me 40 bucks and the new battery i have proven now uh will last far longer than the old one does but the problem was i put it into my apc branded ups i replaced the battery and it still it has a little lcd display 
uh, that shows it's, you know, information about the UPS and the load on it. And it's all very, actually very cool. But it'll also show the estimated runtime based on the current load of the UPS and uh, the capacity of the battery. Replacing the battery did not reset its belief about the capacity of the battery. So it thinks that I have, you know, 188 seconds of pure power before that battery is going to die. Um, in fact, I had a lot less than that, as we proved from uh, from the experiment that we were forced to go through with 714. But this morning, I decided to see how much time uh, my battery has. And I let it run 15 minutes after unplugging it from the wall and things were fine. When I plugged it back in, uh, it said that I had about 25 percent capacity left on the battery. But that still has not, at least based on what I saw the last time I checked. And I try not to check these things while we're doing the show. But the last time I checked, John, it, it still was showing that I had, you know, two or three minutes of battery time left based on the current load. So I think in order to recalibrate my battery, I have to let it completely die. Yeah, because it's saying I have 160 seconds of estimated battery, according to, um, you know, if I pull the thing and ask it, that's not enough. So I guess I got to let it run all the way down. And and that's at least what APCs um, frequently asked questions or knowledge base says it has to go all the way down and die. And then, then it starts to figure out how much power your, how much uh, runtime your battery's got. But I know that it's got plenty of runtime. The problem is it's reporting that it has much less than it really does. So if I plug a device in with a UPS, or a US, sorry, a USB cable, uh, the battery will say going down, going down. When in reality, it's probably got quite a bit of time left. So not so good. Yeah, 159 seconds. Brian Monroe in the chat room is asking. So. Pretty crazy, huh, John? Yeah, it always tickles me. Uh, it, it's hard to estimate battery capacity sometimes mm -hmm. or battery longevity. It's uh, it's not as simple as you'd think. No, it's not. It's not. I just I just wish I could tell it. You know, forget everything you know and just believe this test we're about to do. Right. That that that's the frustrating part. It's like I know. Is there like a re reset button somewhere well i think i think the reset button is to let it die on the battery again which oh which to be fair will happen right i mean i will have an extended power outage at some point and so this thing will recalibrate itself at that at that stage of the game uh you know i can either force it to do it or not there was a discussion in our facebook group uh able there asked you know essentially which ups to get or started answering the question of which ups to get and there's quite a few of of them out there that that are good. Um, I I've always liked APC branded stuff. Their um, warranty department is fantastic. Their support is generally fantastic when I've needed to use it, and also their support in terms of what third party devices will work with them in terms of the USB connection and automatically read it and all that. Your Macs will do it. Your, you know, your Synology disk stations will do it. And it's really handy to get that information exchange with the UPS, assuming of course the UPS has the right information, but uh, be that as it may, they generally do. And there's a, there's a couple of them recommended in there, but really you just need to buy one that matches the size of load that you want to, um, that you want it to handle is, is really what it comes down to. And, and then you can choose whether you want to have a LCD display on it where you get some information out of it or not. I, the BR 1300 G that I have in my office, uh, it, you know, it, it keeps my router alive. It keeps all of my various NAS devices alive. It's a little bit overkill, in terms of its capacity, it's got two batteries that sort of you marry together and, and put in the thing. Um, it's a little overkill, but I'm, I'm okay with a little bit of overkill there, especially now that I've got it and it's in good place. So, so anyway, uh, I'll put a link to that Facebook discussion there. So you don't run UPSs. Is that right, John? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> okay, cool. The thing is ever since... I can count on one hand the number of power outages that I've had since I 
moved here. Yeah. It, it, again, I always say they're more about the power outages you don't know you have, right? The little mm-hmm. brownouts and stuff. Um, I, but again, you might have very consistent power, right? I mean, it, it, there's, you don't know, right? You don't have any power conditioners because they do that too, right? They condition mm-hmm. the power on the way out to your devices. I did, so I did make an effort, and you probably noticed the result of this last time you were here, but I did a few months ago, made a sweep of my house and basically installed surge suppressors everywhere. Sure. So I have some level of protection. I know they don't protect it. And right. I don't think any of them do any sort of conditioning, but I decided that was a baseline that I wanted to meet. So, yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There's, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yep. Um, all right. So uh, where are we on time here? We're at 120. It's probably more than... Uh, but we've got, yeah, we got to do this. We're going to get through them. Uh, Ron from Mac Geek 714. We talked about the Signia Pure Charge and Go NX. And, you know, Ron chimed in. In fact, so many of you chimed in about this. I, I really, I wasn't sure how this would resonate with the audience, but man, like I get more feedback about this than, than a lot of things and positive feedback. A lot of you use it. A lot of you have been considering it. Um, and, and that's great. But uh, Ron, I had met when I spoke down in Princeton and he said, uh, yep, these things are pretty impressive. And uh, he says, I was actually wearing them when we uh, when we met. And I had no idea. I didn't you know, I don't t- generally look behind people's ears. So I totally didn't notice that he had them in. But um, he mentioned something in passing that I that I glossed over. And that is that these are have the ability to be charged wirelessly. It's not a Qi charger. But it is very similar to that, where you just take them and put them kind of in a cradle and they charge. You don't have to replace and fumble around with those batteries, which is a huge headache with hearing aids. So I just wanted to point that out. So thank you, Ron, for reminding me of that. Um, so in uh, in Mac Geek 715, the last episode, most recent episode, I should say, it's not the last episode. Uh we discussed VPNs and such, um, and that led to quite a few bits of interesting feedback. And so we will start with uh, Bill. Actually, you know what? I'm going to. Yeah, yeah, we'll start with Bill here. He said uh, you referenced VPNs and then also remote access. He says, at some point, could you discuss this in more detail? He says, I've managed to get this to work rarely, far from reliably using either Mac OS 10 server or my Netscape router. He says, I can consistently connect to the Netgear uh, router VPN service, but only to then access the internet. I appear to be coming in on a separate subnet than my home network. I contacted Netgear who had people looking into it, but they never had an answer. Hugh to the end of the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, uh, it, so Netgear, so his issue is he wants to access his local network. In addition, he wants to use his VPN at home to access his local network. In addition to being able to have that sort of secure tunnel uh, from wherever he is to home and then back to the outside world. Netgear's routers use open VPN as their server, which is, you know, for better and for worse, right? It's a great well-supported platform, except that it's not natively supported on the iPhone. So you need a separate app to do it, but it's, it's fine. Uh, open VPN lets you, the server administrator configure lots of different things. Only some of which are exposed in various graphic interfaces that we all get to see. And one of those things is the option to allow clients to access the local network of the VPN server or not. And it sounds like by default, Netgear's setup on whatever router he has is is the answer is no, don't support that. Uh, you've got to dig into the settings. I didn't have a Netgear router set up at the time and don't have one set up here that has an open VPN server on it. So I can't uh, dig into that for you. But but that's what you're looking for is dig into those options and see uh, if you have that turned on or turned off. And and maybe if if it's not exposed in the graphic interface, know that it is something that's available, especially in an open VPN server. You might just have to do a little digging to uh, to find it. So. So there you go. There you go. 
so that that's the uh, that's the answer to that one. Do you have any thoughts on that, John? Before we before we get into man in the middle attacks, um, the only other thing that I've wrestled with with some uh, Open VPN clients. So one is this, you know, how can yeah. I access my local network? And, sure. Uh, like you pointed out, I I have that enabled. But the other thing is that I found a lot of times something that gets uh, certain clients upset is uh, DNS resolution. What should happen is that the VPN server should be using its DNS. Mm-hmm. But sometimes I've had it where either it's a bug in the client or something. Sometimes I've had to force oh, yeah, or set it on the client side. You shouldn't have to do that, but right. sometimes I found that it is necessary for whatever reason. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. I honestly, the best VPN server that I've ever had the, pl- had the pleasure of running locally here is Synology's and specifically the one in Synology's routers. Um, it It's even better than the VPN server that they include in disk station manager, uh, which is on their disk stations. Uh, and it's really quite stellar and reliable and uh, like I have no trouble with it. So highly recommended. Uh, the only time that running a VPN server gets interesting is if you also like if you want to have your outbound connections from your home on a VPN, generally most VPN service providers that you would use would not let you have inbound connections uh, across that link. So you can't have an inbound VPN server while you're doing outbound VPN, uh, generally speaking, unless you run them on in different places. So, but one thing we talked about in the last episode uh, was I stood on, on my soapbox and said, if you're connecting to secure websites uh, or even, you know, secure email providers or whatever at your local coffee shop or whatever, you don't need to worry as much about having a VPN because that connection is secure. And I knew, in fact, I, I might've even said this, but certainly in the back of my head, I knew, yep, yeah, somebody's going to yell at me about this. And you did my, uh, bo- our, our email box filled up with it. And so I'm going to read two of those emails and then we can have a short discussion about it, John. Uh, Lex says, you, uh, gentlemen, you will get caught following this advice. He says, any Wi-Fi connection without WPA2 security, so i.e. no password, uh, is very susceptible to man in the middle attacks. A hacker, a.k.a. a script kitty, can set up his own Wi-Fi hotspot, lure you there instead, connect to the original hotspot and offer you a secure TLS connection terminate that on their hotspot and set up their own link to your bank. The device he uses is called a pineapple and you can buy these on the internet with no real fanfare. Your bank cannot detect the use of a pineapple. He says you could if you know how, but it's not easy using a VPN with two factor, two factor authentication or a client side certificate like open VPN does fixes this because in that case, the kitty cannot spoof you. If your Wi-Fi connection is WPA2 secured, but the attacker knows the password, he might be able to do the same, although this requires a far bit, a f- a far more sophistication on his part. So that's Lex. And then uh, and then Jim uh, also chimed in with some thoughts on the process where which, which adds some clarity to what Lex says. He says, I, I respectfully disagree the important aspect of your analysis of VPN while away from your homeland. It is entirely possible, he says, and in fact, not uncommon for an ISP or corporate IT department to inspect TLS traffic transiting their network. And it is not difficult to set up a proxy server, indeed, something that uh, an astute Airbnb provider could even do. But what he points to is, uh, he says, use a fingerprint and Steve Gibson's GRC.com allows you to create a fingerprint for free. He says, the only way I know to detect uh, someone doing this is by making note of your VPN certificates fingerprint, then comparing that to the certificate fingerprint when you first connect to your VPN from a remote site. If your original certificate fingerprint matches the fingerprint from the remote connection, then that means you're connected where you think you're connected and you're good to go. Otherwise you might get caught. So going and creating this fingerprint when you know that you're actually connected to your VPN and then comparing it 
might be the way to go. So we will put a link to Steve Gibson's fingerprint uh, generator in the show notes, of course. Thoughts on that, John? I, they're right. I mean, they're not wrong, right? Uh, you know, uh, our, no, our, the, the, the thing is, they're right. And, you know, I kind of cheered you on in the last episode. I mentioned that there are certain public Wi-Fi servers that, that are not uh, encrypted that I'm comfortable connecting to. And that I'm, you know, one is that, you know, a lot of them, you know, whether it be Stop and Shop or Whole Foods, they show a page saying, you know, yep, it's, uh, you know, it's me. Yeah, right. I'm like, okay. Um, and yes, if somebody wanted to, they could set up these intercept. If I, I agree with everything that was said, the, the thing is, I'm comfortable, and I haven't yet gotten caught. Sure. I'm comfortable with... I'm comfortable with the uh, that the server I'm connecting to is actually the server I'm connecting to or the Wi-Fi access point and that someone's not camping on it and, and or, you know, spoofing it like with this pineapple thing and all that. Yeah, though, they could be, you know, it may happen. Um, well, it may have already so. happened and people just didn't get information from you that they cared about. Right. So. Yeah, it could be. Could be. Um, That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, I mean, you got, I mean, the answer is maybe always when you're out and about, always make a secure connection and, and put a VPN on top of it. So as was pointed out, having, having the, uh, just having the key um, may give, may give an attacker enough to, uh, to capture your traffic. Yeah, to for sure. For some, uh, some good stuff. Uh, and I agree also what was pointed out is that, you know, either a uh, bit. Having multiple layers of security is is probably never a bad thing unless you have to pay lots of money for unless, it. Right. Yeah. Listener Don had chimed in and said he uses a VPN service called Encrypt.me that uh, will automatically connect when he's not on a trusted Wi-Fi network, which is really handy. And he says it, it just works on his iPhone. No problem. It, you know, he's able to whitelist networks. So the way their app works, he whitelists, you know, like his home network and things like that. So he doesn't need to connect. And then when he's out and about, as soon as he connects to a non whitelisted network, then boom, uh, you know, encrypt me fires up and secures the connection and he's good to go. So, and, and encrypt me is not the only one that does this, but, but it is certainly one of them. So I'll throw that out there. Um, not a bad thing. And then that way you just, you know, you're good to go. So. Yeah, I haven't used theirs for a while. Um, Speedify yeah. act added that feature a while ago. Is right. that it'll yell at you if if you're on an insecure connection. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I, that that's one of the other ones. Okay, yeah, great. We'll put that in the that link in the show notes too. All right. I, unfortunately, with all the fun we're having, we're past the ninety minute mark. That's you know, we don't like to go too long on these things for you folks. But sometimes we get uh, you know, we get rolling here. So this was a good one. I'm glad we did this last segment, even though it took an extra, you know, few minutes. So thanks so much for listening, everybody. You uh, you all rock. Like I said, we we couldn't and wouldn't do this without you. We really appreciate all the questions and the tips and all the information. And we've got lots more coming for you. Like I said, we've got a couple of episodes that we're going to record somewhat in advance. And we're actually doing that uh, for those of you that are interested we are doing that on Thursday the 5th. We're going to record two episodes back-to-back -back, uh, at MacGeekGab.com slash stream so you can hear things well in advance of when they make it out uh, here on the feed if you would like. But if you can't make it, don't worry. We will record it just for you, and we'll release it in its due time. Uh, where else are we here? Of course, I want to thank Cashfly, C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. I want to thank our sponsors, of course, Text Expander, as they mentioned in this show. Agile, the makers of one, or Agile Bits, I should say, the makers of 1Password, where you can get three months for free at onepasswordcom slash geekgab. Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com. Barebones Software at Barebones.com. Ring at Ring.com slash MGG. Some cool stuff coming from them, too. So we'll tell you more about that when the time comes. All righty, folks. Have a good one. We'll see you next week. No matter where you are, we will find you or you'll find us. I guess that's how that works. 
But just make sure, wherever you are, maybe you need to use a VPN, maybe you need to go off the grid entirely, just make sure that you don't get caught. Made up.